I ask the member for Shoe Swap to lead the House in prayer or reflection. As we commemorate the one year anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic, we take time to reflect on those that have lost their lives and to the families that have been so tragically impacted. As Canadians and British Columbians, we give thanks to the peace and freedoms that we enjoy. And in spite of the pandemic, we truly have much to be thankful for. Amen. Introduction by members. Madam Clerk. Introduction of bills. Statements by members. Member for Kootenay East. Mr. Speaker, as I've stated in this House on numerous occasions, access to health care in my riding of Kootenay East is difficult to say the least. At one time, a simple two to three hour drive to Alberta has been eliminated as an option and now costly and impractical options are to find your way over several mountain passes and 11 to 12, 13 hour drive times if you're lucky. But there's good news in this story, Mr. Speaker. A service has been created that provides air transportation at no cost to patients requiring urgent care. Angel Flight East Kootenay was founded in 2019 by Brent Bidston, president and lead pilot. Together with his wife and partner Janet Bidston and fellow pilot Todd Wesleylake, this small but mighty team of volunteers have helped over 120 patients from the East Kootenays access much needed medical care in Kelowna since it was founded. And identifying a gap in services, Angel Flight has now grown from Kootenay East to Nelson, Creston and Invermere areas. Last Friday, the director of the regional district of East Kootenays voted unanimously in favor to fund Angel Flight East Kootenay with a sustainable $500,000 pledge to greatly assist this game-changing not-for-profit organization. This money will greatly improve reliability and safety by purchasing a more capable aircraft, which will hopefully include twin engines with pressurized cabins and anti-icing capabilities. Improving reliability will give Angel Flight more options for patient transportation, including less cancellations to, due to volatile weather conditions and quicker delivery time. That said, Kootenay East and other jurisdictions like Columbia River Revelstoke still have a mountain to climb on getting access to health care without financial and geographical barriers. We need to do better to assure our citizens that they will not be forgotten in their greatest time of need. I would like to thank and congratulate the team at Angel Flight East Kootenay for their accomplishments so far and their valued service. But I'd also like to thank the directors of the East Kootenay Regional District for their keen judgment in assisting Angel Flight and securing this now Kootenay amenity. Thank you. Member for Praxwell Qualicum. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. This morning, I would like to introduce to this house, Stephen. As a teenager, Stephen enjoyed skateboarding and playing video games. He spent time at cadets where he had fun, developed close friends and great memories. Though as he grew older, he began experimenting with illicit drugs and eventually started to use regularly. Stephen was a good kid. As an adult, he found his passion for making jewelry and he found stability in a supportive housing complex in Parksville. He wanted help and he was making progress, but then the worst happened. Stephen died alone in his home. He was 33 years old. Several drugs were found in his system, including toxic levels of fentanyl. His mother, Julia, through a grief and heartbreak, wants to be a voice for others. She wants to make sure that no other mother or father or partner or child experiences the unnecessary loss that she did. In December of last year alone, there were 154 illicit drug toxicity deaths in British Columbia, and Stephen was one of them. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to make sure the people in their communities are aware of local drug checking services, of the Lifeguard app, where users will be automatically connected with emergency services in the event of an unexpected overdose, of the non-emergency health information available through 811, including how to access alternatives to the toxic drug supply, and of course, recognizing your local mental health, substance use, and treatment services. We need to have open conversations about this. We need to eliminate the stigma associated with drug use, and we need to work together to save lives in all of our communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Happy Thursday to everyone. Although today marks the grim anniversary of the World Health Organization deeming the COVID-19 outbreak a global pandemic,
Our lives have changed significantly since that time, and nonprofit heroes have stepped up to support those most impacted. Over the last few months, I've had the great honor to get to know many more of the nonprofit organizations in my riding of West Vancouver Capilano and to see the great work that they do supporting the North Shore residents. In mid-February, I had the pleasure of meeting with Joy Hayden and David Aris of the Hollyburn Family Services Society. This society's focus is to put an end to social issues within the community, ensuring that families and children are safe from violence and receiving the tools and support required to lead a life free of violence and oppression. In 2020, the Hollyburn Family Services Society supported over 800 North Shore youth, seniors and families. We have honored women this week through International Women's Day. We know that violence against women has escalated during this pandemic. I'd like to shine a light on Holly Burns Victim Support Program, which has done extraordinary work supporting victims of domestic violence, sexualized assault and criminal harassment. Victim support workers are highly trained in trauma-informed counseling. We hear the term trauma-informed quite frequently, and the explanation of what it means is really quite simple. These trained counselors approach their clients without judgment. The question is always, although not asked, is what happened to you rather than what did you do? I don't know that we can even begin to imagine the emotional and physical impact this kind of work happens on those who do it. Hollyburn is also a partner in the North Shore Integrated Domestic Violence Unit. No one goes into the nonprofit sector to get rich. They do the work because they know how important it is. And as always, I want to remind everyone that nonprofits rely on donations and supports from the communities they serve. Thank you again to Hollyburn Family Services and its team of extraordinary staff and board. Member for Chilliwack, Kent. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I recently had the opportunity to tour a unique space in our province called the Willow Room. The Willow Room was created through a partnership between Ann Davis Transition Society, Wilma House, Pearl Renewal Society, Stalo Women, and the RCMP Domestic Violence Unit with the goal of ensuring that women who are reporting domestic, gender-based, or sexual violence are heard, supported, and not further victimized. This space is specially designed to give women a warm, safe, supportive, and non-institutional place to report to the RCMP. This 24-7 resource, which opened to serve our community in December 2020, with a focus on providing a trauma-informed, culturally sensitive environment for women to safely tell their stories when they are ready. Law enforcement plays a crucial role by using trauma-informed interview techniques and fostering trust. Imagine you had to tell a stranger about the worst thing that ever happened to you, about the biggest hurt and the most devastating betrayal, in a strange place, in detail, repeatedly. Once you imagine it, you may understand why it is estimated that only about 10% of domestic sexual assault and gender-based violence is reported to police. You may understand that the most common reasons given for not reporting are the fear of not being believed, feelings of shame and embarrassment, lack of support, or not knowing how to report. So please know this. In Chilliwack, Kent, thanks to the hard work, partnerships, and commitment of so many, you can file a report by calling the RCMP at 911 or the non-emergency line, and you can ask to make your report at the Willow Room at Ann Davis. Please join me in thanking the Ann Davis Transition Society, Wilma House, Pearl Renewal Society, Stalo Women, and the RCMP Domestic Violence Unit for the initiative, the work, and the partnerships that created this space for women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Lead the third party. According to a 2016 study by the Interparliamentary Union, 44% of female politicians report having received threats of death, rape, assault, or abduction. Reflecting on International Women's Day, these numbers are hard to bear. In the same year that the IPU study came out, British MP Jo Cox was murdered in her constituency. There have been many other prominent assassinations of female politicians. Mexican Mayor Gisela Mota shot dead less than a day after she took office. Somali lawmaker Sado Alwarsame killed in a drive-by shooting in Mogadishu. Swedish Foreign Minister Anna Lynn killed at the age of 46. 
Sitara Al-Chikzai shot dead outside her home in Afghanistan. And again in Afghanistan, Hanif Asafi, head of women's affair, killed by a car bomb. Pakistan's former prime minister, Benazir Bhutto, assassinated. Akhil Al-Hashimi, shot by six men near her home in Baghdad. Galini, Galina Starovotova, Russian Democrat, attacked with a machine gun and pistol, killed instantly. Perhaps most famously, in 1984, Indira Gandhi, shot at home by members of her own security team. All of this happened before Donald Trump initiated the chant, lock her up. Consider that roughly eight in 10 female politicians also indicated that they were survivors of psychological violence, hostile behavior that causes fear or psychological harm. That's eight in 10 of us here. I'm one of those eight. I know I'm not alone. We do not have to feed the culture of violence towards each other, which disproportionately affects women. To achieve better outcomes, we must work across party lines to create a more welcoming environment so that women of color, black, indigenous, LGBTQS+, cis and trans women will feel at ease in these halls that have for so long been dominated by white men. Thank you. Member for Warner Monashi. and appreciate one of our uh, businesses for their contribution to a riding during the pandemic. Okanagan Spirits Craft Distillery, represented by Craft Distillers Guild, uh, BC, in Vernon and in Kelowna. Their distilleries have played a crucial role to help flatten the COVID-19 curve by providing thousands of liters of free hand sanitizers to many healthcare workers, frontline workers, including homeless, uh, homeless shelters, women's shelters, public daycare staff, cashiers at grocery stores and in banks, postal workers, and many more. This list grew over the months and craft distillers Guild of BC uh, and their hardworking staff selflessly kept their distilleries operation open during the pandemic in, in order to help many of us and to meet the crucial demand of hand sanitizers and surface uh, sanitizers. By June 2020, they had also covered all family doctor's offices uh, from Penticton to Revelstoke, the entire Nicola Thompson region, as well as some hospitals. They also expanded to cover North, Central, and South Okanagan band offices and growing list of care homes. Businesses like Okanagan Spirits Craft Distillery and other distilleries in BC deserve all the recognition, appreciation we can provide to them. May I ask, uh, may I please ask members of this house to join me to share our great appreciation with everyone at the Okanagan Spirits Craft Distillery and other distillers for their great contribution and hard work during the most difficult times. Thank you. I call on the Honorable Premier for a ministerial statement. Thank you uh, very much, Honorable Speaker. And it is... Uh, with some sadness uh, that I rise today to acknowledge the one-year anniversary of the World Health Organization declaration of the COVID-19 worldwide pandemic. In the weeks and months that followed that announcement, Honorable Speaker, all of our lives were turned upside down. To date, 85,000 British Columbians have fallen sick from COVID-19 and almost 1,400 have lost their lives. Today, British Columbia joins with provinces and the federal government across the country, flying our flag at half staff to acknowledge the loss of life as a result of the global pandemic. So much has been asked of British Columbians over the past 12 months as we fight COVID-19. Many people have lost their jobs or had their hours reduced. Small businesses have closed their doors to help protect customers and workers. Students have had their schooling interrupted and others, despite the risks, have kept doing important work. Some of those are on the front lines of our healthcare service, childcare operators, and many, many others. Some have driven trucks to keep food on our shelves. Others have kept major infrastructure projects safely operating. Everyone 
has pitched in to practice social distancing, to keep our hands clean, to wear masks, and do whatever we can as individuals to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities. Many people have faced loneliness. All of us have faced uncertainty. This experience has changed us all. The last year has been difficult, but it has also shown the best of British Columbia. Despite the strains and stresses, people have kept looking out for each other. I remember, as many will, standing on my porch at 7 o'clock banging pots to give a little bit of hope and thanks to healthcare workers who were going in the most uncertain of times with potentially inferior protective equipment into healthcare units to protect and work and save those who have been afflicted by COVID-19. The challenges have been immense, not just in the healthcare sector, but right across our economy. But despite these strains, people have been doing the right thing. With very few exceptions, we have avoided racism and division, and the past year has seen extraordinary cooperation in this House and across the country. Now, with vaccines on the horizon, we have new hope. And every day, people across the province will continue to work to fight the pandemic, to protect themselves and their communities. Every vaccination makes all of us safer. But we are far from out of the woods. We know that, we understand that, and we'll continue to collaborate in this House, outside of this House, and in our communities right across British Columbia. To pay tribute to those who have lost their lives, to acknowledge and recognize the sacrifices people have made, to do our best to do what we can about the loneliness and the uncertainty that all of us are experiencing. I believe, and I know you will agree, that although this has been a challenging year, the best of BC is ahead of us. If we continue to focus with uniform uh, purpose on keeping ourselves and our communities safe, we will get out of this and we will be able to recognize those that lost their lives, those who have made extraordinary sacrifices, all for the betterment of British Columbia. Today is a sad day, but it's also a day for hope and optimism. I believe that hope and optimism will get us through the next days, the next weeks, and the next months as we prepare, prepare for a better British Columbia. Leader of Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to uh, thank the Premier for his comments. And today I want to bring uh, some remarks on behalf of uh, the official opposition. Today we commemorate one year since the declaration of a global pandemic after the unprecedented spread of COVID-19. Our flag flying at half-mast is a visible symbol of the impact of the last year on our province and our world. Words can paint a very real picture of the past 12 months. Epidemic, COVID-19, pandemic, social distancing, wash your hands, Zoom calls, you're on mute, room rager, loneliness, loss, separation, kindness, and compassion. Month after month after month, Somehow, it feels so much longer than a year. None of us in this chamber could have imagined the heart-wrenching scenes or the moments of great inspiration that we have seen over the past 52 weeks. Since the pandemic started in our province, we have experienced 85,000 cases of COVID-19, over 4,500 hospitalizations, and nearly 1,400 deaths. Each death, heartbreaking for loved ones, for communities, for British Columbians, for all of us. And we share that sorrow and loss. Each case impacting individuals, their families, their colleagues, and those who cared for them as well. The pandemic has impacted every aspect of our lives, how we live, how we work, how we connect, how we care for one another. It has been devastating. Families have lost loved ones. There have been tragic outcomes in long-term care, job loss, businesses struggling to survive, and a significant toll on people's mental well-being. But through it all, we have seen the strength and the determination of British Columbians, especially those 
who have carefully followed all the guidelines and have done everything they have been asked to do and more. The resilience of British Columbians has been nothing short of remarkable. They have been innovative, creative, and persistent. Every member in this house has witnessed countless acts of kindness and compassion, and I know that because my family experienced them personally. I love the phrase that was shared so often during the pandemic, and the world came together as the people stayed apart. British Columbians did come together, and none more heroically than our frontline workers. They are grocery clerks and truck drivers, transit workers, care aides, nurses and doctors, fighter, uh, firefighters, paramedics, teachers, police officers, childcare workers, the list goes on. They went to work so that we could stay home, and we are so grateful. Who will ever forget, as the Premier referenced, the nightly scene of people banging pots and pans on their balconies at the end of their driveways and in the parking lots of healthcare facilities. And here in the legislature, we must also recognize the tireless efforts of Dr. Bonnie Henry and her team, also the Minister of Health and the, and the Health Ministry team for their non-stop efforts to deal with the pandemic. Today we look back at a year that was like none other, and we look forward with cautious optimism and with a hope that not long from now, we will be, be able to be together again with our families, in communities, and with an even greater sense of pride for this incredible place we call home and the amazing people who live here. While we may disagree about many things in this house, I know we can all agree that British Columbians came together as the people stayed apart. We are proud, we are grateful, and we are hopeful that the kindness, care, and compassion that British Columbians demonstrated will be a lasting legacy of our pandemic experience. That would make this year memorable for all the right reasons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of Third Party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the Premier and the Leader of the Official Opposition for their heartfelt and inspiring words as we mark this day of observance. A year ago today, COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic and our lives were changed in ways that we could have never imagined. Acknowledging the people we've lost further allows us to heal, although I know that that process for many is only just beginning. Being unable to gather to grieve this year is a staggeringly cruel element of this pandemic. And today I hold everyone who has passed and all who have lost loved ones in my heart. I'd also like to acknowledge those who have survived COVID-19 but are struggling with long-term symptoms. We will strive to better protect and support you every day. Soon, I hope, we will once again be able to gather safely, embrace, share a meal, follow the customs, religious practices, and ceremonies that have guided us through tragedies for generations. It has been a horrible, horrible year. But we are finding our way through thanks to the continued dedication and service of frontline workers, healthcare providers, teachers, first responders, janitorial staff, grocery store workers, those who care for our elders and children, the people who feed us, the people who ensure essential goods and services are getting to where they need to be, transit workers. After all we've been through, our world will be forever changed. We have learned unequivocally that everything is interconnected, that nothing matters more than the health and well-being of the people we love, and that we are all willing to make incredible sacrifices to protect people we have never met. I have a glimmer of hope that some of the changes we will carry forward will make our province and our world a kinder, healthier, more just, and caring place. Let's have a moment of silence in the memory of all those who have passed due to COVID-19 and to pray for the loved ones and the families.
Thank you, members. Madam Clerk. Oral questions by members. Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the Premier spoke eloquently in his remarks uh, just moments ago about the arrival of vaccine in British Columbia and the hope that it brings. And we certainly agree with that. Uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine has arrived in British Columbia, and we all know that it comes with an expiry date. Uh, British Columbians are still waiting for details about how exactly that vaccine will be used. So we have raised this question before and have asked that uh, the Premier provide clarity on the order and the criteria for vaccinating priority groups. So I know members in this House and certainly members in the opposition have heard from workers, from teachers, childcare workers, public transit workers, and of course, first responders. So uh, I would once again ask the Premier today, uh, I, I know he's aware that AstraZeneca comes with an expiry date, and if today the Premier could share with us and specifically with those critical frontline workers the plan for the use of AstraZeneca. Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for her question. Uh, and it is absolutely true that the first tranche of uh, the first round of AstraZeneca does have a best before date of uh, April 2nd. Dr. Henry and her team, uh, Dr. Ballum and the immunization team, are looking carefully at where we can best deploy that precious resource uh, to meet the needs of uh, frontline workers and a whole host of others. The member talked about a range of, of workers who are concerned about their place in the queue. Uh, I have to say, and I'm sure that the members in this House have received the same amount of correspondence that I have from firefighters, uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, the range of, of frontline workers, paramedics. The list is long. The, the mail is about two and a half inches thick. Every argument, a valid argument, every one carefully considered by the Public Health Office. Dr. Henry will be deploying the resource as she best sees fit to contain outbreaks. Uh, we've heard of, of course, you know that there will be a, a blanket immunization process underway in Prince Rupert, uh, Port Ed, and Haida Gwaii. Uh, there are examples like that across the province. I know that, um, I should say, I expect uh, further questions on this. I'll leave it to the Minister of Health to go into more precision on how Dr. Henry plans to deploy this, but I want to assure the member and all members of the House, and indeed all British Columbians, that we are going to use what is now a precious resource that's coming in increasing abundance, which is fundamentally important to us getting out of this. Uh, we're going to deploy that resource as we see best fit to protect the most vulnerable in our communities. That's what Dr. Henry's made abundantly clear through her regular briefings, and that's our commitment today. Leader of Official Opposition and Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate uh, the Premier's response. I think British Columbians, and certainly members on this side of the House, do have some very specific questions about the timelines for providing the information. We all recognize that the pandemic, and in fact we just talked about that in very poignant terms, and, and, uh, and we recognize uh, the year that it has been for British Columbia and the world, so the pandemic has been here for a year, and we have celebrated and honored and respected frontline workers. Uh, when we think about that group, and, and the Premier's accurate, accurate, there is a long list. Teachers, first responders, dentists, agricultural workers, transit workers, these groups are waiting, and they have been patient and resilient and hardworking. They deserve to know where they fit in the, on the uh, priority list. Uh, we know that it's important. They're critical frontline workers, and they are facing risks every single day. So with the deadline that is attached to AstraZeneca, could the Premier at least indicate the, prior, the prioritization, which workers can expect to get a vaccination, and when? Premier. Well, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And again, Dr. Henry is the expert in this area. She's working with the uh, immunization team to make sure that we don't leave one drop of vaccine underutilized over the next number of weeks and months. Uh, I, I want to pause, though, and, and uh, speak a little bit more comprehensively on, on the context for the, the member's question. And we, we've all agreed and acknowledged that there are no shortage of people deserving of immediate immunization. But our challenge is not uh, with this federal government 
not even with the last federal government, successive federal governments going back 25 years that let our ability to immunize ourselves atrophy. I'm not blaming anyone when I say that, Honorable Speaker. I'm just stating the facts. Our ability to do what other pro uh, jurisdictions are doing has been compromised. And we now acknowledge that. And thank goodness the life sciences sector here in British Columbia is well placed to lead the renewal of that, uh, that ability here in BC. Having said all of that, we're dependent on offshore supplies. We saw a very disappointing uh, drop in uh, delivery in uh, early February that took a little bit of the wind out of all of our sails. We were absolutely enthusiastic about the prospect of mass immunization, starting with the most vulnerable, making sure that we could target the populations that the member and I agree on are critical to the well-being of our, our communities. Uh, but again, with a limited supply, uh, we're leaving it up to Dr. Henry to give us the advice that we believe will best allow us to meet the needs of everyone. Every vaccination delivered makes us a little bit safer, whether we're frontline workers, whether we're elected representatives, whether we're family members uh, in the, uh, the, the various component parts of our beautiful province. So uh, I, again, will allow the Minister of Health, I'm sure, in subsequent questions to get into more precision on this. I thank the member for her question, and I want to acknowledge, as she has, that we need to make sure we're speaking with one voice coming out of this. And I know the two of us will keep doing that. Member for Kelowna Mission. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. As mentioned, we have a limited and sporadic supply. And as AstraZeneca vaccine arrives and larger and larger numbers of British Columbians need to be booked for appointments, we only have one health authority in this province with an online system. This is the most important public health effort in our lifetime. But this government has failed to create an online registration option despite having a year to get ready. To the Premier, why is there no universal online booking system? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the honourable member for her question and I want to say, um, express my appreciation to the leader of the opposition, to the former leader of the opposition, the member for Vancouver, Koshena, uh, the health critic, the former health critic, the member for Kelowna Lake Country and the leader of the Green Party for all of their questions, but also their support and contribution and acts of personal generosity over the past year, which I uh, deeply appreciate. With respect to uh, the booking system uh, for COVID-19 vaccinations, as members will know, uh, starting at noon today, we are advancing uh, to the next group of uh, British Columbians in our age base effort. Uh, those born uh, in 1936 or before, between the ages of 85 to 89. Over the last number of days, as of 9 o'clock today, 41,661 people have booked their appointments. And I wanted to acknowledge the uh, excellent work in the last number of days of TELUS and of health authorities in improving systems and responses to people such that in health authorities today, there's uh, a one minute wait time on average this morning uh, for calls that we've received. So all of that is good, as you know, uh, for the 75 to 79 uh, category, starting with that and then throughout to after that in the pandemic, there will also be an addition to call centers and online platform at that time. This was part of the presentation that was made to the opposition and everyone else uh, a week ago last Monday, and we should see that soon. Member for Kelowna, mission on supplemental. Thank you, and thanks for that answer. And based on that, we only have about 7.4 million more bookings to go. The province of Quebec opened online registrations over two weeks ago. They registered 100,000 people on day one. Lori Dahlgren is one of thousands of frustrated British Columbians, and she says, and I quote, they've known this has been coming for a long time. They've had plenty of time to get ready, and it's unacceptable. It should be online right now. It just doesn't make any sense in this day and age that they couldn't get with the program, end quote. Again, to the Premier, why is there no online system now? Minister of Health. 
Uh, Honorable Speaker, um, in the first phase of the pandemic, public health organized 1,390 clinics across BC, delivering uh, full immunizations uh, in long-term care and assisted living to many frontline healthcare workers, of course, to uh, and to many other vulnerable people, including people in rural and remote Indigenous communities. As vaccine came, that vaccine was delivered into people's arms in an efficient way, representing, I think, an extraordinary collective effort by everybody in public health care. And that is what we're continuing to do. The main limitation, as the member will know, and as the Premier noted, is the amount of vaccine we have. And we have organized uh, based on very important principles. Those principles, most importantly, are to protect those who have the highest vulnerability to COVID-19 first. That's the reason we, we started with long-term care and we've seen the effectiveness of the vaccine in that venue. And now we're working through, uh, based on age, the general population. We'll also be using um, the AstraZeneca resource. There are, uh, we have received, uh, as the leader of the opposition noted, 68,000 doses of AstraZeneca have now arrived. We'll be receiving in late April a further 136,000 and in late May a further 68,000 doses of AstraZeneca. The priority right now, as the Premier has said and as Dr. Henry has said, is dealing with outbreaks and exposures in workplaces right now in the most high risk industries to COVID-19. That is happening now and will happen with the first doses of COVID-19, 41,000 of, of which of the 68,000 will expire on April the 2nd. So that is the approach being taken there. And then next week we'll be presenting uh, the plan for the, for the following 204,000 doses in the next two rounds. So this effort, I think, the, our immunization effort in BC has been highly organized. Uh, we organized and delivered vaccine to long-term care before other jurisdictions, including some of the ones mentioned by the honourable member. And I think the team who's leading this immunization campaign in public health is doing an exceptional job. Thank you, Minister. Leader of the third party. Thank you, honourable speaker. Today marks six months since the NDP government re released the old growth strategic review panel report, although to be clear, this government had the report, has had the report nearly a year. They received it in April 2020, but chose not to share it with the public until September. The report called for a paradigm shift in our approach to forestry in British Columbia, especially our ongoing gross mismanagement of old growth. One of the key recommendations is to immediately defer logging of the most at-risk old growth to prevent loss of rare ecosystems. And the report specified this must happen within six months. Here we are, and this government still has not taken any meaningful action to protect these forests. Instead, we are losing critical old growth stands as the old strategy of talk and log continues. My question through you, Honourable Speaker, is to the Minister of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations. It's now been six months since government released this report and many months into her tenure as minister. Where is the action that was promised to protect our most endangered old growth forests? Minister of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I thank the leader of the third party for this question. And it's important to remember that, that for too long, there has been a, a divisive and, and patchwork approach to how old growth forests are managed in our province. Uh, those who are calling for a return to the status quo are, are, are putting BC's majestic old growth and, and vital biodiversity at risk. And those who are calling for an immediate moratorium are ignoring the needs of thousands of workers and families in forest dependent communities right across our province. We want old growth forests to be appreciated by people today and in years to come. It's also a priority for our government to support good jobs for people in BC's forestry sector. That's why our government asked the independent panel to advise us on how we can do better when it comes to protecting our old growth forests. And our government is dedicated to implementing the recommendations to ensure new holistic approaches to how we manage BC's old growth forests. Leader of third party on supplemental. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And let's just go through that answer a little bit. A divisive and patchwork response uh, is actually resulting in a particularly divisive and patchwork uh, old growth forests that are left in this province, which are diminishing by the day. 
Uh, the minister talks about an immediate moratorium, which is not what the panel recommended. It recommended si a six-month uh, work with its deadline for deferral. And when the minister says she asked the panel to advise, that is exactly what they've done. What I've pointed out in my question, Honourable Speaker, is that the government has not responded to that advice that was given and that promise that was made by the Premier during the September election campaign that all recommendations of that panel's report would be followed by this government. A necessary first step is to immediate is the immediate interim protection across BC to create some breathing room and protect what we have left. My question again is to the Minister of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations. We can't afford years of delay on this anymore. When will she fulfill the promise that was made to implement the old growth panel recommendations beginning with immediate interim protections in our high risk old growth forests? Minister of Forest Land, Natural Resource Operations. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to correct some inaccuracies from the member. We have taken some important first steps when it comes to taking action to protect old growth and implement the recommendations from the report. The independent panel recommended we involve Indigenous governments and organizations within the first six months of releasing the report, and we have done that and continue to engage with Indigenous governments and organizations on this. The panel also recommended we take immediate action to protect ecosystems at very high risk, we have also done that. For example, over 170,000 hectares of old growth in the Clayquot Sound, about 1,000 hectares of old growth in Stockdale Creek, almost 10,000 hectares in Upper Southgate River. This coastal rainforest is home to wildlife and multiple species of salmon, and that is just to name a few. We have also initiated action on two other recommendations aimed at improving public information and compliance. And while we have taken these important first steps, as recommended by the panel, within six months, we know there is much more work to do. And we are dedicated to continuing in this important work with government-to-government -government discussions with Indigenous leaders, uh, talking to our partners in labour, industry, environmental organisation and communities. We have taken those first initial steps and there is more to do and we are committed we are committed to following the recommendations of the Old Growth Report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Peace River South. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. So the Premier is asking this House to approve another $13 billion without telling anyone how it will be spent in defiance of the Financial Administration Act. The last time we approved $1.5 billion without knowing how it would be spent, the Premier used that to craft his own election platform and then never even got that money out the door. We've seen nothing but a botched small business recovery grant, delayed COVID rebate program, and little in the way of any accountability from this government. How can the Premier rightly ask for another mystery fund of $13 billion when we have no idea how that money is going to be spent. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think, uh, let's be really clear, Mr. Speaker, we are in uh, a pandemic. We've been here for a year. Everyone here in this House has acknowledged how important it is to support people. We've been uh, here uh, in this very hybrid uh, style of uh, doing the people's work and recognizing how important it is to support people. And that's exactly what we've been doing this entire year. And I want to thank the members opposite for their collaboration. Uh, and we are still in the pandemic. We're going to continue to support uh, people here in British Columbia. We're going to continue to support businesses in, in, in British Columbia because that's what they need from their government, Mr. Speaker. Member for Peace River South. Well, thank you. Let's be clear. The last time we've seen this type of disregard for provincial financial rules was in the 1990s, when the NDP government presented the infamous fudget budget. The Premier should know this all too well. He was working in the Ministry of Finance at that time. The now Health Minister was the Principal Secretary for NDP Glenn Clark, Premier of the time. And this Premier's Chief of Staff was also working back then in Glenn Clark's office. Seems the same players are back on the field and history is now repeating itself. So will 
the Premier admit he's, he's in violation of the purpose of the Financial Administration Act by asking for another $13 billion without even showing anybody how that money is going to be spent. Minister of Finance. Well, Mr. Speaker, well, back in the 90s, I was raising some small babies, um, and it was a very busy time uh, for, for me. Uh, so I don't know what the member is referring to. I wasn't here in this place. Uh, but I, again, Mr. Speaker, I want to be very clear. We have been in a pandemic. We have been in a pandemic, Mr. Speaker. Everyone here stood in this place today acknowledging how difficult it has been for so many, the sacrifices people have made, those who have been going to work to make sure that we were healthy. And the demand on government has been to be there for people. We have been there for people. We will continue to be there for people, Mr. Speaker, because that's the kind of government we are. Member for Kamloops, South Thompson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Premier has uh, indeed bungled his COVID recovery uh, rebate. Uh, he has completely botched the small business uh, uh, recovery grant uh, program. Uh, he's delayed the budget and quarterly reports, uh, blaming that on an election, which he called. And now he doesn't seem to care about BC's budget transparency laws. So my question is this, uh, how are we supposed to give the Premier a blank check for $13 billion with no budget and no spending plan? Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the, the members opposite will know full well that we do interim supply every single spring. That this, and that, uh, Mr. Speaker, and Mr. And Mr. Speaker, Given the, uh, the, the state of affairs around this pandemic, it's absolutely critical that we continue to do the work that British Columbians depend on us, which is to be there for them, to make sure that their supports are there. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite uh, uh, mentioned the, um, the BC recovery benefit. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to rise in this House, Mr. Speaker, and, and point out that 2.3 million people have received a recovery benefit. They have received a recovery benefit. And Mr. Speaker, that amounts to well over a billion dollars. And not only that, Mr. Speaker, that's a billion dollars that's going into the local economies. Mr. Speaker. Members, and, and Mr. Speaker. Members, let's listen to the answer, please. I want, I want to tell members a story about what it really means for communities around this province. So I heard from someone uh, um, when they, um, a friend of mine whose mother, 75 years old, was anxious about going online. She went online. She got her recovery benefit within three or four days. And then she did a Zoom call with two of her elderly friends. And they were making plans about where they were going to go in their community to spend their recovery benefit. Because, Mr. Speaker, that money is circulating in communities. It's making a difference for British Columbian businesses. It's making a difference for British Columbian uh, communities. And it is helping to take care of all of us through this pandemic. Member for Kamloops, South Thompson, on supplemental. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Premier has delayed the budget. He's delayed the quarter re, uh, quarterly reports. He's expanded the use of, of special warrants. Uh, he hasn't released the TELUS contract, which we've been calling for all week. Uh, he hid a critical long-term care report during the recent provincial election. And now the Premier wants to spend $13 billion without a budget and no spending plan. No details, Mr. Speaker. So my question again to the Premier, why is he bit by bit manipulating BC's budget process and why does he no longer care about BC's budget transparency laws? Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think British Columbians know exactly how much this government cares about them. That's why we have been delivering for them. That's why we have recovery benefits. That's why we have uh, business recovery opportunities. It is why we are uh, you know, making sure that we have robust plans in place to get the vaccinations into people's arms, Mr. Speaker. British Columbians know very much how much their, their government cares about them. Member for Abbotsford West. Uh, thanks, Honorable uh, Speaker. Well, as we've heard, there's uh, another anniversary uh, taking place uh, this spring. It uh, was 25 years ago that the uh, most notorious example of budgetary manipulation and chicanery took place, the NDP fudget budget, 
the finance minister says uh, ancient history, except, except it was the history of the premier, it was the history of the health minister, the history of the premier's chief of staff. Members hey, the band's to the back together again. The budgetary blues brothers are back on the road and they're playing the same playlist, Mr. Speaker. You know, over the last three years, over the last three, you, you can always tell when the government's uncomfortable, can't you, Mr. Member Speaker? Member, continue. The, uh, over the last three years, this Premier and this government have steadily dismantled the very statutory safeguards that were put in place after the budget budget to guard against budgetary chicanery. And now, led by the same people uh, that were involved in that, they are seeking spending authority, Mr. Speaker, for $13 billion without a single line a single line describing what that money will be spent for. Not only have they not provide, uh, provided a budget for the coming fiscal year, and, and here's the really fascinating part, they have tied spending for the next three months to get this. The budget that was presented 13 months ago that the Premier himself acknowledged wasn't accurate three weeks after it was presented, Mr. Speaker. How can British Columbians have any confidence whatsoever in a government that is ignoring the legal requirements of responsible budgeting and basing its spending plans on a budget that the Premier himself acknowledged was out of date days after it was presented in this House 13 months ago? Minister of Finance. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, certainly uh, the member uh, is 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 uh, trying to spin a narrative that is so far from reality that I think British Columbians should be embarrassed at the official opposition. There is a pandemic still, honourable member. We just spoke about that today recognizing the sacrifices and the challenges that so many British Columbians have endured for 12 months. The sacrifices that they have made by going to work, by taking care of our children, by caring for our aging parents, by making sure there's groceries there for us when we need them, Mr. Speaker. And just like everybody else has really ch been challenged, to uh, accommodate this change, there has been some changes as a result of the pandemic here before this House. We are in an unprecedented time. There's a tremendous amount of work that needs to go into making sure that British Columbians continue to get the supports that they need. And that's why we're delivering the budget on April 20th, honorable member. You will see a budget that will detail exactly how we will move, fo move forward, continuing to protect British Columbians and build a road for economic recovery. Here, here. Member for Abbotsford West on supplemental. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. What is clear and becomes increasingly more clear every day is that this government, this premier, and apparently this finance minister are incapable, incapable of abiding by the basic legal requirements of budgeting that, by the way, earned this province the reputation as a leader in Canada, not a leader, the leader for transparent and responsible budgeting, Mr. Speaker. Talk, 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 about, talk about fiscal sleight of hand, and I'm, I'm waiting for the minister to tell me what part of what I'm about to say is inaccurate. The Premier and the Finance Minister are actually asking the House to agree to this, Mr. Speaker. They are asking the House to agree that last year's pre-pandemic budget pre-pandemic budget will be deemed to be this year's budget. They will deem it to be this year's budget, Mr. Speaker, so that they can spend $13 billion. Now, if anything I have just said is inaccurate, the minister can stand up and rebut it. The NDP, Mr. Speaker, must be the only government in the entire world 
in the entire world using a pre-pandemic 2020 budget as the basis for spending authority over a year later in the midst of a pandemic-plagued economy. Mr. Speaker, why is the NDP, this is my question, why is the NDP consistently, consistently incapable of following the basic rules around responsible and transparent budgeting? And why does the Premier believe that his government should be given permission to spend $13 billion on the basis of absolutely zero in the way of description and by tying that spending to a budget that he himself acknowledged was out of date days after it was tabled 13 months ago. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the member opposite what is, mentions transparency. Well, I seem to recall that there was an ICBC document and pages got torn out and yeah. wasn't that sort of on the, when they were on this yeah. side of the house or something about that. So I don't think that the folks over on the other side can say much about transparency. Mr. Speaker, what British Columbians need to know, what British Columbians need to know is that we have demonstrated our commitment as a government to be there for them. We have brought in supports, we've brought in services, we have been taking care of businesses and people, their health care needs. We have been there for them, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to be there for them, and I'm very proud of what our government has done and what we're going to keep doing. The bell and the question period, Madam Clerk. Orders of the day. House Leader. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. I call committee, committee Stage Bill 6, Homeowner Grant Act. Committee Chair. Pathetic.
Thank you, members. All right, we will resume uh, the committee stage of Bill 6, uh, and I believe we were on Clause 20. Uh, member for Peace River South. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm, you know, we're almost finished on Clause 20. Just want to kind of uh, just bring us back to where we were, I guess, a couple of days ago now on this bill. Uh, obviously, in Clause 20, we're talking about the whole application process for the grants. One of the areas I didn't canvas yet, and uh, I just want to maybe just preface by saying I'm not trying to take the minister down any rabbit hole uh, with these questions. This is uh, legitimate questions I'm just concerned about and I'm hearing from people. And it's more of an explanatory opportunity as well. Um, we talked about people within municipalities. We've talked about regional districts and regional districts who mostly have been either phone or online. The minister acknowledged uh, earlier, which is now what we're moving to for uh, municipalities uh, when, if this bill passes. And uh, what, I'm, what my first question and thought is, is how does it work, can the minister explain, for First Nations on reserve land? Now I know it's federal, so there's differences around this. Uh, I think her and I both know the answer, uh, but I have had people in the public asking about this, so can she just uh, put some clarification around reserve lands, please? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, the, the, the answer is it depends. Um, it depends on whether the First Nation is the taxing authority or in some cases it is a municipal government that is a taxing authority depending on the, um, how it's established. So if it's a First Nation taxing authority, these amendments have absolutely no change. Member. So just to confirm though, the Minister said at the very onset of this that uh, uh, the First Nations weren't impacted at all, so UNDRIP wasn't considered uh, the, what we passed in this House. Um, so First Nations weren't consulted on this bill at all. Is, uh, did I hear her correctly at the beginning of this?
Minister. Thank you. I appreciate the people speaking in my ear um, and all of their work um, on this. Um, and so that the member uh, has been asking about um, treaty lands um, and the role of First Nations. Um, and so um, because of the, we're taking the Homeowner Grant Amendment Act doesn't affect Indigenous peoples wholesale, um, except uh, in the case where uh, they pay taxes to municipality, for example. Um, it's just transferring over uh, the program. Um, those um, Treaty First Nations uh, that uh, are the taxing authority, it doesn't have any impact on them. Um, should they uh, wanna talk with us about uh, any change, we're certainly open to those conversations. Member. Well, I'm probably not gonna expect an answer from the minister, um, and I'm not gonna go down uh, too long on this issue. It just does surprise me from that, though, um, when we stood in this house and we passed UNDRIP, the very first thing that this government said is that every bill that was going to be in front of this house, they would be consulting and working with First Nations. So obviously that was done then. The minister is saying this doesn't affect or impact First Nations at all in the province. I'm assuming that consultation was done. Does she have a document she can table in the house today to show that, that they have uh, allowed this to proceed after consultation and it doesn't affect them? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, keeping in mind that we're simply centralizing and modernizing delivery of the Homeowner Grant Program, we're not changing eligibility requirements. Um, the Homeowner Grant Amendment Act does not affect Indigenous people in, in BC in a unique way, uh, and we have confirmed that there's no notification requirement under um, UNDRIP. Member. Thank you. Who, con who confirmed that there was no notification required? Did the First Nations uh, Leadership Council or somebody say to the minister and to government, don't worry about contacting us? or did the ministry or her staff make that determination? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. So as part of uh, a matter of course, uh, since um, you know, the passing of UNDRIP, we consult with legal counsel that, uh, that understands the, the minutia of the, that legislation, and they provide legal advice about what, what the obligations are, and we follow their legal advice. Member. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, that's not what was discussed in this House. At no time do I remember the Premier or any minister saying that they would be determining through legal counsel whether the government chose to consult with First Nations or not. Uh, everybody stood in this House and said First Nations would be consulted on every law, every bill, when it was before it was brought to this House. At no time was there a caveat put in by anyone that I remember, and I stand to be corrected if the minister wants to correct me and say, no, we stood in this House and said we would not consult on every bill, uh, that we would only seek legal counsel. Uh, but I was here that day when there was a lot of uh, pomp and circumstance in this uh, facility around uh, the UNDRIP bill. And now we've seen almost every bill that's hit this house. Uh, the government now tries to hide behind, uh, well, we've sought legal counsel and we don't have to consult with First Nations, which brings us back to then why did the government put so much fanfare around a bill to begin with if they weren't actually going to follow that bill? You know, this is why we're hearing comments out there, is it was all politics. It was not actually for First Nations. My question, and I'm going to move on, because I think I've made my point, and the minister has acknowledged how she uh, chooses to answer this, and government has acknowledged their uh, fact that they're not following through with uh, the promises that they made in this House. Uh, but just more on the technical point, uh, is there any difference, and uh, the minister answered a question a second ago, uh, around First Nations treaty land. Is there any difference for a First Nations person who lives off reserve, who holds um, title of a house off reserve, applying for a homeowner's grant? Are they treated the same and equal as everybody else? Minister. Thank you. Well, to, uh, directly to the member's uh, specific question, yes, they're treated like everyone else. Nothing has changed in terms of the, 
the context about who uh, gets their homeowner's grant, but I think it's really important to get on the record that uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act is, a, is, a leg is legislation that this House adopted. And for every single bill that comes forward, it gets um, vetted through that legislation. And that's what legal counsel does. They are trained in the minutia of that bill, and they provide advice for every single bill that, uh, that this government uh, brings forward. Um, looks at uh, the requirements uh, uh, that we have as government in relation to that bill. And there is certainly lots of work to do, for sure, about um, continuing to follow through on our commitment as a government, and we're committed to keep doing that. Um, and as part of the process, every single bill we make, that, that determination is made about our legal obligations. Uh, and I look forward to continued work with First Nations uh, to make sure that uh, there's, there's justice and reconciliation happening um, on the ground. Shall Clause 20 pass? Aye. So ordered. Uh, Clause 21, member for Peace River South. Thank you, Chair. Um, in reading through Clause 21 here, it's my understanding that it adds new sections related to the adjustment of grants, allows for grants to be adjusted if an applicant is entitled to, to more money uh, than they received. Uh, so my first question on, on this section, I, uh, when I'm going through this, will adjustments be reviewed um, and made by grant administrators as, as part of the administration process, or will individuals themselves need to apply for an adjustment for an amount uh, that they receive? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. So the, the answer is both. <laughs> uh, so uh, the grant administrator will do periodic reviews uh, to ensure that, uh, for, I guess from an audit sort of perspective, to make sure that uh, people are getting their full entitlement, as well as the applicant uh, is also to make a request. Member. We're just trying to follow through with that, so the applicant is supposed to make a request. So there are uh, times then if the administrator is only doing an audit and the person doesn't make the request, there'll be times where things don't match up. Because um, I'm assuming the audit isn't done on every single uh, 1.1 million uh, households, and so it'll be sporadic or however the uh, administrator chooses to do that. So there is times, I think the minister acknowledged this before, but just for clarity, there are times then if it's not caught in the audit and if it's not uh, caught by the person themselves that, uh, you know, obviously uh, things don't match up and the proper grants weren't ad uh, administered or allowed. Minister. Thank you. Um, and, 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 and hence, is, I think, is, is one of the uh, a good rationale for, for um, transferring the program centrally because it'll be a more robust application. We'll be able to catch uh, those uh, examples where people might not realize that they're now eligible for a seniors, the additional seniors benefit, for example, because they have to put in their birth year and it will automatically let them know what they're entitled to. Whereas in the olden days with pen and paper, you'd have to 
uh, you might not do the calculation, your, you know, you do the calculation yourself, uh, and so you might miss that opportunity. So we are expecting that it will actually um, catch those opportunities um, more efficiently uh, so that we would actually uh, see more people uh, get their our full entitlement. Member. Uh, thank you to the uh, minister for that answer. So. Um, it gets a little convoluted, a little uh, confusing sometimes for these, so I know the minister is probably very thankful herself to have uh, people in her ear as she uh, uh, continues to say, and I want to again thank, thank staff uh, uh, for helping both of us out in the house here as we, as we work through this to make sure we're getting the information out for people. Uh, under section uh, 10.2 of, of this part of the bill, subsection 4, I want to read out in uh, D. And this will uh, ex explain a little bit of why I'm asking the questions of trying to understand this. Despite the cancellation, the previously approved grant applied or otherwise dealt with under this act is deemed to have been applied or otherwise dealt with in relation to the new applicant as if the amount of the previously approved grant were part of the amount in the new grant. I know the minister is saying that's so straightforward, but uh, with that, uh, can the minister provide an example actually of how the grants will be... Uh, uh, amounts are calculated under this section. Minister. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So um, it, it just so happens in this, uh, I guess, sentence, uh, which is strung together in a very long-winded way, um, this, this is actually the mechanics of the example that I used previously. So uh, if uh, uh, I make an application uh, for the grant and I am not yet a senior, but my spouse is, uh, then it allows the, the spouse who's the senior, it, it sort of cancels my application and puts in my spouse's application so that we can get, and my spouse can get the senior grant, uh, and that would be applied to the taxes. Uh, um, so we would send that to the municipality and it would readjust their taxes so that they get the full amount. And so this section is the mechanics of making sure that that can happen. Member. Well, thank you. Well, the minister just sparked another th question, I guess, in my head with that, with that answer. Um, I possibly should know this, but when you are applying for the grant, does it matter on who's uh, the title owner of that house? Because not in every situation does the spouse have it joint. Sometimes it could be under the husband, sometimes it would be under the wife. Uh, does that have any determining factor on who's eligible to apply for the grant? Minister. Thank you very much. And sometimes it's the wife and the wife or the parent and the child in terms of who's on title. I just want to, for equity and inclusion, I want to recognize that 
We have many different kinds of families, um, uh, and, but you do need to be on title in order to apply for the grant. So that, that is the requirement. So, member for Peace River South. Uh, thank you. Under 10.3, uh, subsection 2, uh, the collector of the jurisdiction in which the property is located, um, does that mean the municipality that's administering the grant when it talks about the collector of the jurisdiction? Minister. Yes, that's correct. Member. Who's responsible for providing a refund uh, or, or, or collecting an amount uh, owing? So with that, is it the municipality or is it the province under this new system? Minister. Thank you. Uh, if it's in a municipal area, then it would be the municipality. Shall Clause 21 pass? So ordered. Shall Clause 22 pass? So ordered. Shall Clause 23 pass? So ordered. Shall Clause 24? Member of Peace River South on Clause 24. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Again, I know there's a lot of changes going through in order to enable for the province uh, to bring this in. Um, and part of section 24 is enabling the reporting uh, to and from province and municipalities, if I have this correct. And it also improves, uh, we'll determine what that means, uh, data sharing uh, between the two. Uh, so maybe my first question will be, how much and what types of information relating to approvals of grants will be shared with the province uh, between the province and municipalities? What kind of information is going back and forth? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, so municipalities uh, will be required to send tax amounts for each property to the province. And the province, uh, so they'll have to gather that information and, send, and, and share that with, with the province. And the province will uh, share back property details and grants amounts for each property. Member. We canvassed a little bit yesterday um, uh, a couple of questions I think came up on the collection of social insurance numbers. And um, so the minister has acknowledged, so I won't go into too much detail on that, the minister has acknowledged that change that, um, you know, I might ask some more questions later on about, again, about why uh, that's so important outside of the homeowner's grant uh, application process. Uh, but my, my question, I guess, around this is now that the province is going to be gathering more information such as the social insurance number, and it appears it might be, that information might be moving around within government or municipalities a little bit more um, freely. Minister acknowledged that they have, uh, uh, they say that they have adequate protections in place of that. But was a privacy impact assessment done for this initiative?
Minister. Thank you. Um, I want to assure the member that uh, the social insurance information or personal information broadly is not being sent back to the municipality. That's not what, uh, what is being considered here. Um, and that a privacy uh, assessment uh, was done, uh, uh, both for the legislation and for the program. Member. Is the minister able to share um, what concerns, if any, uh, were raised during that assessment that the ministry would have had to look at maybe as they were formulating this bill? Thank you. I want to assure the member that uh, no issues were raised uh, during, uh, uh, through the privacy impact assessment. Member. Okay, no, I appreciate uh, hearing that. Will, um, will the information that's being gathered, this extra information with the social insurance number and whatever is uh, taking place uh, within the ministry and within the administer of this, uh, will the information be used as part of any other data merging or data sharing within government? The minister did speak a little bit to this, I politely say vaguely yesterday. Um, I'm just curious though, um, this is going into one specific administrator under the homeowner's grant, uh, but government is collecting this information. And the minister acknowledged uh, in some of her previous comments that part of this is to try to alleviate and stop fraud. Um, but she's also uh, mentioned comments uh, before, uh, and we reference back to the, the uh, vacancy tax, for instance, and others. Is, so are they gonna be able, to, is the ministry gonna be able to share this information possibly with other branches within the ministry uh, for any other programs they are presently doing or maybe even in the future? Minister. Thank you very much. 
Mr. Chair, so the, um, the authority, um, the, uh, the tax administration authorities uh, have existed for many years around gathering personal information in order to uh, provide appropriate taxation. Uh, the, um, the, the tax administration department within the ministry already has, um, you know, a, a lot of personal information uh, as, a, as a taxing authority. And so this uh, information resides within the same department, uh, and, uh, and there's no, nothing new that is being added that the, uh, the tax administration authorities um, already have there. So there's, no, there's really no change in what they do with the information that they currently gather. Uh, this is the same, it goes into the same administ uh, part of the, my administration uh, that already has information uh, related to, to taxing. Member. So with that answer, what's the reason for collecting the social insurance number from everybody if the minister is saying government already has everybody's information? Minister. Thank you. So what's different is that we didn't have that information to the homeowner grant. So that's what's what we're, we're, we're doing here. Uh, but the uh, but we've always had the authority uh, to have that information that's always existed as part of the tax administration component. So it's just about making sure that it's it's just about tying it to the homeowner grant. Member. So, so it sounds like the minister is saying they've always had the authority, but they didn't always initiate on that authority, so they don't actually have all the information. So they actually are increasing um, personal information within the ministry. Um, I guess one of the questions on that, though, would be, um, is there a possibility or any initiatives to share that information um, throughout different apartments for different reasons because um, obviously if so, there'd be additional security safeguards that would need to be put into place then if we are truly gathering information the ministry doesn't have already. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and I know that the member opposite likely knows that uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the tax uh, ad administration in my ministry um, doesn't share any information with any other part of government, and this would be treated in the exact same way, so it wouldn't be used for any other purposes. Member. Could the information be used by the minister within her ministry to create any new tax initiatives or tax policy then?
Minister. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to, uh, you know, take a moment to remind the member about the, the, the whole purpose of, of doing this. And, uh, you know, while I certainly um, uh, um, speak to the fact that municipalities, you know, are really, I think, pleased that we're that we're doing this is a, an up an up. I don't want to say an up grab, but it's the opposite of a download, an up upload. It's an upload. Um, we need to remember that this is about making sure that uh, you know uh, that we're reducing fraud and that um, and, and making sure that people you know get their full entitlements so that we can sort of cross reference. And so we need to have the tools in order to do that to make sure that you know seniors are getting their their full eligibility. But also you know making sure that people aren't getting homeowner grants in two or three different municipalities because. You're only entitled to one homeowner grant. So this is a tool that we have um, available to us by uh, centralizing the whole entire system. Um, and this, the best place to do that, uh, uh, Honorable Chair, is within our in our tax department. This, this is a this is a. Uh, a, a central repository for all of the personal information, where everything is, you know is kept uh, for all the taxation purposes. And so it's for that reason, again, Honorable Chair, that we're. Um, um, making sure that we understand um, who's applying for the grants, um, are they entitled to the grants, are they getting their full entitlement to the grant, and having a centralized uh, process for doing that uh, is, is really important to, to making sure that we can uh, maximize uh, benefits for those uh, who are in, entitled to the grant, and make sure that those who aren't entitled uh, to it um, aren't taking advantage of a uh, um, I'm not going to call it piecemeal, it's just that every municipality has been doing it on their own and they're not uh, talking to each other. And so it's really through this mechanism that we're able to, uh, to deliver this and make sure that it works well for British Columbians. Member. Well, thank you, Chair. That was uh, a great answer of explaining what we're doing here, except for it didn't quite cover my, uh, the theme of my, my question. I mean, obviously, the Minister has been saying throughout this that um, you know, it's just taking away a uh, responsibility, I guess, of, of local government and centralizing it. Uh, but again, it does come down to the fact that, that government is going to be collecting more personal information of individuals. Uh, as the minister rightfully has said, uh, if there are situations out there uh, of fraud or duplicate or multiple applications under the homeowner grant situation uh, to try to catch those, um, a couple days ago, we heard the minister say that that could be upwards of just a spot check of estimation of up to 33,000 homes. Um, be interesting to see how that actually translates now into when this becomes centralized into government, the reality of that. Um, but the minister didn't quite answer where I was going with the question. It's not so much today. It's not so much this homeowner grant specifically. It's the fact that within the ministry, they're going to be continuing to gather more personal information of people that they could use outside now of the homeowner grant situation. So that's why my question is more around can, not, maybe not will, can the minister, ministry, use this information that they've gathered when they, in the future, at any time, decide on any other tax policy on where they want to go. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and I, uh, I suspect that uh, the member opposite uh, wants to take a, a political, what I'll call a political lens or a, perhaps a partisan lens on this. Um, um, and and the, the reality is, and the member knows this full well, that um, you know, governments can um, use whatever information they have to help inform public policy. And uh, uh, so, you know, uh, whether uh, should the member opposite be fortunate in, I don't know, another 15 years have the opportunity to be on this side of the house, <laughs> um, then perhaps, you know, uh, they too will be able to take a look at what information government has and make uh, policy decisions based on uh, the information that they gather. That is how all governments operate. Member. 
Well, well thank you, Chair. I'm actually hopefully, uh, hopefully going to have an opportunity to be on that side of the House a lot sooner than that. Uh, the, the fact will be whether I'm running again or not, but, <laughs> but next election, obviously, the, the way the NDP are rolling things out right now, there's a lot of questions, and that's why we're asking them in the House today. I mean, this is one of the concerns. I guess by the Minister's answer, um, the answer was yes. Uh, by the minister saying that you know government can use whatever information they have as they're moving forward with future policy or tax initiatives, uh, which just goes back to the point of some of the concerns we're hearing of yet again the, this government trying to collect more information, and it does make some people worried about you know Big Brother government wants more of my information. How are they going to use that uh, against me in future years? So again, that not to take away from the whole intent of the the act itself. Uh, that we have, uh, that we're talking about today in, in Bill 6. Um, but is the minister contemplating maybe introducing any, any um, new housing taxes uh, now that she'll have this information? And I, I look at that because, you know, the minister has said, you know, 1.1 million or more uh, people, and we hope a lot more down the road of people who are uh, working hard and fortunate enough to be homeowners in the province. Uh, but outside of the grant process itself, this information gathered, uh, does the minister then you know, look at maybe any new housing taxes that could be applied now that she'll have that information? Minister. No. A member on Clause 24. Well, I'm sure there's lots of people excited by that uh, answer. I guess we'll have to see if that answer means tomorrow or years down the road, but uh, we, uh, it's yet to be seen. Just want to go to a different uh, point before we leave this section, uh, Chair. Looking at the the clock here, um, when we talk about the data sharing, can the minister explain again what, so I can understand the role of the municipality uh, specifically? Um, under this act, you know some things are going to change, but where, what communication has been made, and what criteria is there, and what is the role of the municipality uh, when it comes to data sharing? Minister. Thank you. Uh, this is similar to, I think, a, a, an earlier question, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back uh, again. So the municipality's role is to uh, send the tax amount for each property to the province. The province will then calculate the grant amount for each property um, and then send the information back so that the municipality applies the approved amount to each property. Um, and noting the hour, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I move that the committee rise, report progress, and ask leave to sit again. Thank you, Mem Minister. Uh, members, uh, vote's about to take place. Uh, you've heard the motion. All those in favor, indicate aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Thank you, Minister. I'll await the arrival of the, the speaker. Committee Chair. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Committee reports progress on Bill 6 and seeks leave to sit again. When shall the committee sit again, Minister? At the next sitting. So ordered. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I move that the House do now adjourn. Honourable Members, you heard the motion. All those in favour indicate aye. Aye. Those who oppose indicate nay. 
This House stand adjourned until 1.30 this afternoon.